Already Lost and Found, a First Chapter Friday read-aloud video and author interview with The Word Nerd and Dan Gemeinhart. Today as you listen, play along. Watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down, word by word, and then turn it in to your teacher. Stay all the way to the end to see if you've written it down correctly. Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm going to be reading to you from Coyote Lost and Found by Dan Gemeinhart. And before I tell you another thing, and trust me, I've got lots of things to tell you today, um, I need you to pause for a second because this book is a sequel, which means it is the second book in a series. And if you have not read The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise, the first book in the series, I want you to pause. I want you to go to this video and listen to it, and then you can come back for this one. The other things I need to tell you um, are... Coyote is one of my most favorite main characters of all time, um, and you are going to love her too and her story, which I will tell you more about uh, in just a second. The third thing I need to tell you, though, before we do the blurb and before we do the very first, very short first chapter of this sequel, um, I want to tell you that the author, Dan Gemeinhart, is going to join us for an interview after we're done. So, recap one, listen to the first chapter of the first book. To then come back for the sequel because it features my favorite main character of all time, and that's really saying something. And then three, stay to the end so that you can listen in on my conversation with Dan. All right, good? Everybody on board? All right, so once you've done your homework and listened to the first book, or maybe you've been waiting for the sequel with bated breath like I have, um, and we're ready to dive in. It's been almost a year since Coyote and her dad left the road behind and settled down in a small Oregon town, spent time grieving the loss of her mom and sisters and trying to fit in at school. But just as life is becoming a new version of normal, Coyote discovers a box containing her mom's ashes, and she thinks she might finally be ready to say goodbye. So Coyote and her dad gear up for an epic cross-country road trip to scatter the ashes at her mom's chosen resting place. The only problem? Coyote has no idea where that resting place is, and the secret's hidden in a book that Coyote mistakenly sold last year somewhere in the country. Now it's up to Coyote to track down the treasured book without her dad finding out it's ever been lost. It's time to fire up their trusty bus Jaeger, pick up some old friends, discover some new ones, and hit the road on another unforgettable adventure. It's so good, you guys, and I'm so excited for you to listen to chapter one of Coyote Lost and Found, book two in the Coyote Sunrise series by Dan Gemeinhart. Sometimes stories start with a bang, and sometimes stories start with a whisper, and sometimes stories start with a robbery or a car chase or a fist fight or someone being born or someone dying. Sometimes stories start with a kitten. I mean, the funny thing about stories is they don't really start or stop at all. It's just the telling that starts or stops. In this story, it could start when me and my dad finally settled down for a bit and got off the road and into a house. Or it could begin when I started real school for the first time in five years. Or heck, it could start six years before that when something terrible happened that tore a hole in the universe. Or at least it felt like it did. But nah, I think this story starts with me on a bus finding a box. Now, the bus wasn't moving at the time, and no, the box wasn't buried. My, no, the box wasn't my buried memory box. That's a whole different story. In this particular case, the bus was parked next to a house in Oregon that I happened to be living in, and the box held something almost as precious as memories. So there you go. Once upon a time, I was hanging out alone on an old bus, and I was bored. The bus was named Jaeger. It could be some folks don't see the need to name a bus, but then again, some folks haven't had the chance to get to know a bus as well as I have. Heck, me and my dad, who I'll mostly just call Rodeo since that's what he likes to be called, had lived on that old bus for five years after that hole got torn in the universe. We'd taken out all the seats except for the first couple of rows and bolted in a couch and some shelves and a big chair we called the throne. And he even had a room in the back with a bed and a knot and a curtain in it for a door and everything. Jaeger was weird, and Jaeger was funky, and Jaeger got looks everywhere we went, but Jaeger was home. Even though I was the one who really wanted to settle down and stop living on Jaeger in the first place, once we finally stopped rambling and actually had a house that didn't have wheels, 
it turns out I still wanted to hang out on that bus a lot of the time. So I'd run an extension cord out to it, strung up pretty white Christmas lights all up inside, and it was kind of my home away from home, except it was parked right next to my home, so it wasn't really all that away. On the particular March Sunday when this story started, I was laying there on the couch in the bus half reading a book. My cat, Ivan, was laying warm on my chest, purring when I scratched behind his ears. I shook my head and let the book drop to the ground beside me and tisked my tongue. It's no good, bud, I said. Ivan opened his eyes and looked into mine. Ivan is perfect in nearly every way, but one of his best perfections is how good of a listener he is. This book is perfectly fine, but there are way too many flat out amazing books in the world to waste my time reading a perfectly fine one, right? Ivan yawned in agreement. I sighed and looked around. It would have been a great day to have a friend over if, you know, I had any friends, not counting cats, but I didn't, not counting cats. I saw Rodeo's bookshelf a little way away, so I scooted Ivan down off me and ambled over to take a look. I knelt down, squinting at the titles, hoping something would grab me. The Little Prince was pretty great, but I'd read that plenty already. Same with The Old Man in the Sea and I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Ivan sidled up beside me, rubbing on my hip, tail held high. I eyed a tattered paperback book of poetry by Khalil Gibran. I'd read some of it and dug it enough, but wasn't sure I was in the mood for poetry just then. I went to grab it anyway, but as I did, Ivan rubbed hard on my elbow with his chin, and my hand went crooked, and instead of grabbing the book, I knocked it back. It fell with a muffled thump into the darkness between the shelf and the wall of the bus. Crud, I said, leaning forward and turning sideways to reach blindly with one hand behind the shelf. Ivan came in close to my face, purring. Stay out of this cat, I said, grunting. My fingers brushed against what I was pretty sure was the spine of the book, and I stuck my tongue out and stretched farther and grabbed it. But my fingers didn't close around a book. It was something else. It had corners and edges, but it was bigger and heavier than a book. I gripped it harder and pulled it up just before it slipped from my fingers with a solid thud. I sat back on my knees and slid the thing toward me into the light. It was a box that looked like a briefcase without a handle, made of dark wood with tarnished metal at the corners, just small enough to fit in that hidden space behind the shelf, but big enough that Ivan could have curled up inside it if it was open, which I'm pretty sure is 100% what he would do. I sat there for a second looking at that box. It had a feeling to it. It felt secret. It felt hidden. It felt important. It felt, to be honest, like a once upon a time. And there was this fact. Jaeger was not that big. And it had been my home for five years. I'd lived and breathed and slept and woke and eaten and laughed and cried in the cozy space between those four walls, and I'd never seen that box before. So it was secret. It was hidden. And it sure as heck wasn't my secret which meant that it had to be rodeos. And rodeo is a lot of things, but a secret keeper ain't really one of them. He was the type to brag about how productive a trip to the bathroom had been. What kind of secret would a fellow like that keep from a girl like me? Ivan rubbed his chin against the corner of the box the way cats do. Shoo, I said, but my heart wasn't in it. I spun that box around and found two latches snapped shut. I swallowed. Opening up those latches was surely a step there'd be no coming back from. Funny how life does that sometimes, gives you a little warning, whispers, a little promise. What do you think, Ivan? I asked in a hushed voice. Meow, Ivan said. He's not a big talker. Okay, I said. I bit my lip. You say so. I snapped open one of the latches. Ivan's ears perked at the click. Holding my breath, I undid the second one. The box sat there, one big unanswered question. All that was left was to lift the lid. I took hold of the dusty wood with both hands and I raised it up. The soft yellow glow of the Christmas lights filtered down into the box. The box was mostly full, and what it was mostly full of was gritty, gray dust. I frowned just for a second. It took me a realize, a second to realize. It wasn't dust in the secret box. 
It was Ash. What in the... I started to whisper, but then it hit me. And I knew, I just knew. Goosebumps sprang up on my arms. A lump grew dull and sharp at the same time in my throat. I blinked, then again against the sudden heat in my eyes. Oh, I whispered. Hi, Mom. Oh, you guys, that is where we're going to end our first chapter of Coyote Lost and Found. This is an incredible adventure, um, a journey, great characters, crazy plot twists, um, and something that you are going to love. But before you keep reading, even though I know you really, really want to, uh, let's go chat with the author, Dan Gemeinhardt readers we are in for a real treat because we are here with author dan gemeinhardt dan thanks so much for joining us today thanks so much for having me i'm excited to chat with you today me too uh i was telling people that this uh that coyote is one of my favorite characters ever and we're gonna get to her next uh but first i want to ask you a little bit about your childhood um in your bio it said that you were born in germany and that you moved around a whole lot um, and I, I guess it's kind of like a three-part question. I want to know what was, what's the prettiest place you've ever lived? Like the coolest views? Um, you know, I would actually say now. So we live right now, we live in central Washington state. So over in the top left corner of the country. And we don't live in the big city that everyone knows, Seattle, over by the ocean. We live in a little town up in the mountains, um, the Cascade Mountains. And so it's a pretty place. Like people vacation here to go kayaking and rock climbing and backpacking. And so we've got mountains and foothills and trees and lots of wildlife. Um, and so luck, luckily enough, we feel really grateful to be where we're at. I think right now I live in the prettiest place I've ever lived. That, love that for you guys. My second question is what place have you lived that had the best food? I'm going to kind of cheat on this one um, because I didn't really live there. But when I went away to college, my parents moved again. So they moved a lot when I was growing up. Um, and then they moved down to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I went and visited them many times. And I lived there with them like on Christmas break and stuff. So I guess you could say I lived there. Um, but New Mexican food is so good with the red chilies and the green chilies and the roasted chilies, all the chilies, basically. Um, yeah. It's a little different than like Mexican food, New Mexican food. Um, and I, I love New Mexican food. And I still like make it and cook it um, to this day. So uh, yeah. New Mexico is the best food. Okay, well, I've never been to New Mexico, but now I have a reason to go. Um, and the final living question is, where did you live that either had the strangest landmark or like the strangest tradition? Um, I would say at, right after college, me and my wife, we taught abroad for a year and we lived in Cairo, Egypt. And so we lived um, by the pyramids um, there in Giza. And it was it was awesome. Like it, Egypt's a beautiful place, warm and friendly people. We loved it. Um, and the pyramids are amazing. Like sometimes yeah. we go to those big landmarks you've seen a million times in movies and postcards and stuff. It's kind of disappointing. Yeah. Pyramids not disappoint. Pyramids yeah. were incredible and jaw dropping and really, really cool to see. The Sphinx was surprisingly disappointing, much smaller than I thought the Sphinx was. Yeah. Um, the pyramids themselves were incredible. And so I don't, it's pretty tough to beat that as far as a landmark. Um, so I would definitely yeah. say Cairo, Egypt. All right, that it lives up to the hype. I will, you know, it was already on the list, but I'll maybe just move it higher. Um, nice. Okay, so in the intro to the to reading chapter one, so the readers have listened to Coyote Lost and Found chapter one. Um, I said that Coyote is one of my most favorite characters ever. I just love her voice. I love her spirit. And so I'm curious if she's modeled after a real person um, or how you, you know, created her personality. And also, do you as a writer do something to keep track of those details um, so that like they stay fresh for you and you don't confuse them with other characters you've written um, or other characters in the book? Um, lots of great questions. And I love talking about character. I could talk about character all day long because character is the most important part of the story. It's even more important than the plot, because if your reader cares about your character, they'll care about those events in the plot. And if they don't care about your character, they won't. No matter how cool your plot is, if they're not rooting for that main character, they're not going to care about it. Um, and so, and it's also the funnest media part. That's where the emotion comes from. That's where the humor comes from are, are those people that are, or animals that are in the story. Um, and Coyote, you know, it's, it's, she's got a big personality. She's a big character. And a lot of times you really struggle with your with your main character, with their voice and what would they do? And you spend a lot of time thinking, OK, how would they react to here? How can I show who they are? Who is this kid or this dog or whatever? I never struggle with Coyote for some reason. From day one, page one of book one through the end of the second book, 
she was somewhere alive in my head. She was always ready to start talking. And I never had to sit and close my eyes and think, what would she do? What would she think? She was always telling me exactly what she thought. And so it's one of those happy accidents. Sometimes yeah. with writing as in anything, sometimes you have to work really hard at things. Um, and sometimes things just kind of come to you. And Coyote just kind of fell into my lap. And I have a lot of fun writing her. That's pretty much why I wrote the second book is just because I liked her so much and I miss her so much. Um, and, but she's not based on a real person. No, she is completely okay. of my imagination, I guess. Um, and it, a, a lot of fun to write. So how do you make a character pop out like that, hopefully, and feel real? Yeah. Really, it's through character choices. That's how a reader gets to know a character is not by you saying, this is a nice character. This is a funny character, but by that character doing nice things or doing funny things. And so I always look at my scenes and my chapters, especially the first few scenes and chapters, like what are the choices that the character makes in these first three or four chapters that are going to show the reader who they are? Um, so, and that's something I think about all the time. And when there's things that happen in the plot, um, is there any way to make it happen because of a choice a character makes? Not just random happen. Oh, no, this thing fell out of the mm -hmm. sky. But make the events happen because of a choice the character makes. It just makes the story better. And again, that's how we get to know the character and root for the character. Doesn't mean it's always the right choice. Your character needs to make mistakes and make bad decisions. Yeah. And Coyote, Coyote makes plenty of those. Um, <laughs> she does we, in this book. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, and so, yeah, I love thinking about characters, working on characters, talking about characters, because they're really the engine and the heart of the story. Yeah. So good. So good, kids. I hope you were listening to that. Uh, teachers who want to be writers. I hope you were you were listening to that. I, I had to cheat. I forgot question number three. Um, question number three is that this is a sequel. Uh, in some regards, I figured that that made it easier to write and perhaps also harder to write. So would you tell us one thing that's easier to write about a sequel and one thing that's harder to write about a sequel? Right, sure. Um, and you know, technically, this does not matter, but technically it's not a sequel. It's a standalone companion because yeah. I, tr I tried to write it in a way that you wouldn't have to read the first one to read the second one. I mean, if you read the first one first, I think you'll get a little more out of it because you just know the mm -hmm. character better. Um, but I tried to make it like, it's not one story broken into two parts. It's two distinct stories. Um, but it, I mean, for all intents and purposes, yes, it, it's yes. part two, whatever. It's Coyote's second story. Um, and you know, one thing that makes it easier is not having to get to know the character and build the character as much. Again, I tried to do that so new readers would still know her. Um, but like when you're starting a whole new story, whole new parent, um, family, whole new characters, whole new world, you're doing a lot of searching and figuring out um, and painting the picture and building it all up. Um, just And before you even start, like the plot is like you're introducing mm -hmm. yourself, the reader to this world, this character, this life, this kid, whatever. Um, and with a, with a part two or a standalone companion or a sequel, a lot of that's already done. So I already yeah. had a character. I had family dynamic. I had the dad. I had Salvador the friend. I had her cat. Um, and so that's 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 nice. That's that makes it mm -hmm. in some respects easier. Um, as far as what makes it harder is I really struggle with that, which is one reason it I had like four years in between these two books. Is I knew right when I finished the first one I wanted to write another one, but part twos are tricky because it needs to be a, a lot like the first one. So if someone read the first one and loved it, they're not going to be disappointed. You don't want it to be a whole different thing because if they choose to read number two, that's probably yeah. because they like what they got in number one. So it needs to be a lot the same and deliver the same kind of stuff. But it also needs to be kind of totally different. You don't want it to be the same story rehashed because then it's boring and it's repetitive and it's obvious. And so it needs to be really the same, but also really different. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of tricky. And so I struggled with what exactly could Coyote's next adventure be that would hit a lot of the same notes and give a lot of the same stuff, but also be fresh and different and original. And so that that was the tricky part is making it stand on its own, but also be, you know, strongly connected to the first one. Um, and I did the best that I could. Well, I think you pulled it off. Good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, my next question is that for 13 years, you were a teacher and a librarian. Um, I'm guessing you were writing a little bit at that time uh, as well. But um, what was your go-to book recommendation or series? Like when a kid came into the library, like we all have those books that are our absolute favorites. Like, is there one for you that you were like, hands down, everybody's going to love this book? Oh, nice. So I would say in essence, no, because one of the great <laughs> things about books and one of the great things about being a librarian 
is that it's so personal and it's so individual. What kid are you talking to? What have they read that they liked? What have they read that they didn't like? What are they in the mood for? Do they want a long book or a short book? Do they, I mean, it, it's really yeah. super individual. That's why there's 13,000 books in a library because um, it, it all depends why you're reading, what you're reading, what you're in the mood for, uh, the kind of stuff that you like. And so there is no one book that every kid's going to like. Um, and that's that's the cool thing. There might be you know a book that only one kid's going to like, but it's the perfect book for that kid. And it's amazing if you can connect a kid with the perfect book for them in that moment, what they want. But I mean, some of my many, many, many favorites. Um, I love um, The One and Only Ivan, of course. I love mm -hmm. Walk to Boons. I love um, Ghosts by Jason Reynolds. Mm -hmm. I love Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. I love um, Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. Yeah. Um, Insignificant Events in the Life of a Cactus by Dusty Bowling. A Snicker of Magic by Natalie Lloyd. Um, I mean, I could go on and on yeah. and on about the books that I love. Um, there's so many great books, but then like um, then you've got kids that are really, really love graphic novels. And so there's a whole suite of graphic novels that you can recommend for kids. Everything from the funny, silly ones to the big, dark fantasy. Like you got the Amulet books by mm -hmm. Kazuki, the great books. Um, and so, and you've got poetry books. Oh, like what kid doesn't love Where the Sidewalk Ends? That's been around since I yeah. was a kid. Kids still love it. And so that's one of the delightful things about being a librarian is you don't have like, oh, here comes a kid. I'll give them the same book. I always give every kid. No way. It's really individual and unique to what that kid needs and wants at that moment. Right. That's why we love the stories. That's why we love them. Um, okay. Uh, last question is that you, again, on your author bio said that you wrote for 10 years before your first book got published. And so if there's somebody listening who has been like working on something for a really, really long time. And they're just like not getting to where they want to go, especially not as fast as they want to go. What advice, whether it's writing a book or doing anything else, like what advice would you give to that person who is like stuck in the muck of trying and not getting where they want to go quite yet? That I love, I love talking about that. That's like one of the main things I talk about when I do school visits because it did. It took me dozens and dozens of tries. I wrote several books that never got published. It took me 10 years before I got a book deal. Um, and that that's how it is for a lot of people with a lot of dreams or goals or whatever. Um, and so I talk about several things. I talk about the growth mindset, um, like the power of yet. Like I'm maybe I say I'm not good enough. Okay. Change that to maybe I'm not good enough yet, but if I work a little harder, if I try something new, if I practice a little more, I'll get a little bit better and a little bit better. If you get a little bit better or a little bit closer tomorrow than you were today, even if it's one inch, then you're heading in the right direction and you keep getting a little bit better and keep working on it and getting feedback and doing the hard work of practice and keep getting a little bit better. So you can't give up after after one failure, like a story that I tell, it's a famous story. Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player of mm -hmm. all time, didn't make his high school team when he first tried out. He got cut. He wasn't good enough. Obviously, he didn't give up. He worked twice as hard, spent twice as much time in the gym, tried out again the next year, made it, became a star. And so there's people that don't succeed or they get cut or whatever. They don't make the team and they quit. They say, I guess I'm not good enough. Okay, that's one approach. Or you can say, maybe I'm not good enough yet but I'm going to work even harder and get a little bit better next try. And that's really all that it takes. I had so many chances to give up um, and I just kept trying to get a little bit better um, and kept not giving up. And then here I am. I got to see my dream come true and I feel super lucky and super grateful. And it's not because I was a good writer. I was a terrible writer. I spent a decade writing awful books. It's only because I didn't give up and I kept trying. Awesome. Such great advice. Such great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, before we let you go, and thanks for great books. Like, I'm so glad you didn't give up because they're so good. Um, before we let you go for real, uh, can you tell us anything that you're working on that we could expect next? Sure. So I've got um, a super fun picture book that comes out next year um, in July. I should know that. I think July. Um, and then I do have my next chapter book coming out. I'm working hard on it, really. It's due September 15th. And so I don't know when you guys are watching this. But right now, it's late August. Um, September 15th is not very far away. Um, and it's a pretty hard deadline because I already missed the soft deadline. So, um, But it's another middle grade novel. It's another kind of journey story. It's an unlikely friendship. Um, a lot goes wrong. A lot goes right. Um, I think it's my my funniest book yet. I mean, there's still a lot of heart. I love emotion. Hopefully there'll be some scenes where people tear up. Um, but in other parts, it's like a pure comedy. And so I'm really excited. I, mean, I love the characters. I love the, the whole plot and the world and the journey. Um, it's realistic, contemporary realistic fiction. Um, and it's called Busted. Um, 
Um, and it'll come out in the fall of 2025 if I can get it done in the next three weeks, which I will. Okay. I'm super excited right. about that. We will send you our good productive vibes to help make that happen. Um, if a reader has a question that you and I didn't chat about and they want to talk to you, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Best way is through my website, which is just dangemeinhart.com. If you can spell my last name, dangemeinhart.com. And on several different pages on that site, there's like a thing that says, send Dan a note or send Dan a message or something. You click on it and you can send me an email. Be sure when you do that, when there's a spot where you type your email in, it has to be exactly right. It happens to me all the time. I get a really sweet email from a kid and I go to reply and it bounces back because they type their email address in wrong. And I have no way of knowing how to fix it. Yeah. Um, so, and also a lot of school districts, they'll block outside mail. So I may not be able to reply, but I do reply every time. And hopefully most of the time people get it. But yeah, dangamidar.com. Yeah, I will make sure to link that down below. And I can attest that it works because that's how I got in touch with you. So um, okay. it does work. Maybe use a personal email or maybe have your parents help you email. Um, or maybe the teacher could send an email. Anyway, so thank you, Dan, for your time. Um, everybody, thanks for listening and tuning in. We will see you back here next week for another First Chapter Friday video. Happy reading. Awesome, thanks. This week's mystery quote says, we lose a lot, all of us, on our journeys. There's no way around that. But we find a lot, too, if we're lucky. To continue reading Coyote Lost and Found by Dan Gemeinhart, pick up a copy from your school library, Purchase one from your favorite local indie bookstore or grab it via the link in the video description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. I've got more than 180 middle grade and young adult novels, novels in verse, graphic novels, and more waiting there for you. Thanks so much for visiting my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. Please like this video and subscribe. I'll see you again next time. Happy reading. Teachers, before you go, check the link in the video description box so I can deliver Word Nerd goodness directly to your inbox twice a month. Tons of First Chapter Friday freebies and more are waiting for you.